If I were to describe how the average Catholic looks at the world today, I'd describe it like this. Broad and wide is the way that leads to heaven, and everybody's going that way. And narrow is the door that leads to hell, and hardly anybody's going that way. But you know what? That's just the opposite of what Jesus himself tells us the situation is. Broad and wide is the way that leads to destruction, and many are traveling that way. And narrow is the door that leads to life, and few there are who are finding it. Now, Jesus didn't say this because this is how it has to be. People who are on the Broadway don't have to stay on the Broadway, and that's where we come in. That's where our prayer, that's where our love, that's where our intercession, that's where our witness comes in. We need to really invite people to leave the path that's leading to destruction and find the person of Jesus Christ who can lead them to true life here on this earth and eternal life. Hey, welcome to another week of The Choices We Face. We have as our guest today, Father John Ricardo, with whom many of you are familiar. Father John is the pastor of Our Lady of Good Counsel Church in Plymouth, Michigan. It's about 20 minutes from Ann Arbor where we're taping this right now, and it's in the Archdiocese of Detroit. Welcome, Father John. Thanks, Ralph. Well, you know, we're going to talk today about a topic that's a hot topic. You know, we're going to talk about marriage and family life and human sexuality and how this has become such an issue in the church and in the world today. I mean, it's like in the news almost every single day. And do, do you encounter that, that as, as you're dealing with people, as you're talking to people, that they've got questions about wh what, what is this all about? Or, you know? Yeah, as you say, this is a hot topic. And uh, unfortunately, it's one which, which doesn't lend itself to calm, rational discourse. It lends itself to that and to... Um, name calling and to accusations. Uh, this is a really, as we know, right, this is a really significant time in our country. This is a very significant issue. Um, and it's disturbing to me, quite honestly, that we don't seem to have um, the wherewithal to have a rational discussion. And, you know, the church always just says, we're not imposing anything. This is a great uh, illustration of this. The church never imposes it's always proposing, and it's proposing the gospel of life, uh, all that Jesus wants to say to us about how to find the way to happiness. And if there's a, a place where we're confused right now in our culture more than sexuality, I don't know where it is. Yeah, no, that's, that seems to be at the root of so many things going on right now, including a growing hostility to, to Christ and the church because of our perceived kind of what they call irrational stance on, on, on human sexuality. So I, I was uh, fortunate to live in Rome uh, back in the early 90s. And uh, when I was there, I had the great opportunity to, to lead people on what's called the Scavi tour, the excavations down to Peter's grave. So you begin outside um, where the, the obelisk, which is in the center of the piazza, used to stand when Peter died. And so the, the early Christians uh, were put to death, including Peter in games which the Emperor Nero started back in the, f the fall of 64. Yeah, let's entertain the population with killing Christians. Yeah, and so here's, <laughs> yeah. but I would always say to people, this was back in 92, 93, I would always say to folks, you know, I'd try to stress a couple of different things, how they died, but why Nero killed them. So the, you know, the official crime, if you will, was he, he, he blamed them for starting the fire in Rome, um, which they didn't start, he did, most likely. Um, they were considered atheists uh, because they wouldn't worship the gods of Rome. Yeah. But the, the thing that always struck me is um, kind of like the public level, the Christians were considered enemies of the human race. Wow. Yeah. And why, why were they considered enemies of the human um, race? Because they wouldn't worship the, the gods of Rome and because they, they held themselves aloof from those things which the Roman population thought were the essentials for life. Mm -hmm. And so I remember saying to people, you know, I, I, you know I'm no prophet, but uh, I'm afraid that's exactly what they're going to accuse us of being again one day. And it's going to be on this issue. It's going to be on marriage. And it's going to be on marriage because it looks like, if we don't know what we're talking about, it looks like we're enemies of love, um, we're bigots, we're intolerant, um, we're just holding on to some vestige from some long ago, better gone age. And unfortunately, my concern is for, for many Catholics, for many Christians, but for many Catholics, 
we not only don't know what the church teaches, which is problematic enough, but at least as importantly, we don't know why. Mm -hmm. And if I don't know why, and I just say, well, the church says X, well, then I do look bigoted. Yeah. I do look intolerant. I yeah. do look like I'm some sort of enemy of love. Yeah. Well, Father John, let's, this is an opportunity to describe what the church, why the church, what the church teaches about marriage and sexuality and why. So really simply, this is, this is uh, maybe a dumbed down version of Thomas Aquinas, but um, Aquinas would say, um, God hates sin for one reason and one reason only. And the one reason is because it's harmful to me. Yeah, it blocks people from the, the happiness that God created them for. It blocks people from the, 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 the blessings that the Lord has for right. the human race. It's yeah. not because it's a law. It's not because it's some arbitrary thing. It's not that it's, it's not even that it's wrong. Like I try to encourage people all the time, be very careful when we're talking about moral issues. Um, moral issues don't, ha don't rest so much on faith. They rest on reason. So whatever the moral teaching is, whether it's sexuality, whether it's, um, you know, gossip, whatever the case might be, the church is basically saying, if you and I will use our heads, if we'll use our reason, if we'll use the mind which God has given to us, I should be able to understand what the reasons are why this behavior is dangerous for me, not wrong, dangerous for me, harmful to yeah. me, how it can lead to death. Yeah, and, that, and that's really important that, that this is how reality is really structured and, and, and a clear mind can see that. But it's also true, and like Vatican I says, that all these things, truths, are, are available to reason, but because of our disordered desires, because of the confusion, because of the wounds of sin, sometimes our, our, our thinking gets corrupted, you know, and, and we can't see what we really That's feel, right. you know, should and, be and, able to say. And I get that. You know, I'm, like I'm always trying to encourage people, here's the problem with being human, right? I have a bent will. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we don't want to see what's what we're seeing. Right, I, I, I may be more in touch with that than others, I don't know, but I, I know I have a rebellious will. And I know that about everybody. I mean, that's the, that's the wound of original sin, right? I want to be God. I want to decide for me what's right. God puts in front of me life and death, and I'm so disordered, we all are, that he has to tell me, choose life. You'd think that would be pretty hey, buddy, obvious, right? Yeah, like, over here, hey, this is, this, is where, this is what you want, over here. Yeah, but instead we're going, life, death. Oh, wow, I know I should choose the life one, but this looks attractive, and I know that. So I, I get that. Having said that, though, here's a, here's a very uh, important area in our lives, sexuality in general, this issue in particular, where if I, can, if I know that you're doing something which is harmful to you, and I have the kindness to say something to you. I don't you know, beat you over the yeah. head, I don't call you names, I don't, I don't condemn you, I don't say you're gonna burn in hell, I just say, Ralph, I, th I think that behavior, I think, not I believe, I think that behavior is dangerous for you. How does that make me a bigot? Yeah, yeah. Isn't that an act of love? Yeah, well even like Paul says, with tears, with tears, I, I implore you, you know, I mean like, you know, it's out of love, it's out of sorrow, it's out of the concern for the happiness of the other person that we want them to choose what will make them happy. Now, you gotta say though, Father John, what, what does the church teach about so, marriage and sexuality? So here's what the church, so there's a couple different places you can come at this. So people might talk about, um, uh, sacramentality of marriage, people might talk about the benefits of the culture and the state, uh, you know, of a, of a man and a woman getting married. I, those are all very important. I'll let other people handle that. My focus when I'm trying to teach people and talk to people is um, certain sexual behaviors, homosexual acts, not friendship. Another distinction. I have no doubts. I really have no doubts that two men can love each other or two women can love each other. Um, I'm sure people who commit adultery might actually have some genuine love for each other, but the act of adultery, that's not a loving act. That's a harmful act. So with a situation like this, we're not talking about friendship. We're not talking about any of that. I'm just trying to help people understand when you actually engage in those sexual actions, those actions are harmful to you. And if you ask any and doctor, to the other person. And to the other person. And if you ask any doctor or any nurse, they will tell you that. 
I mean, there is no book that I can show you on the benefits of homosexual actions. It, it, it just doesn't exist, right? So to say that is not to hate. To say that is to love. Yeah. Well, I, I was just talking to a medical student at, at, at a very prestigious medical school, and he says there's so much emphasis on warning patients about behavior that will harm their health. You gotta warn them about not smoking because it's really clear that it ruins your health. You gotta warn them about alcohol consumption. You gotta warn them about uh, diet. But you can't say a word about homosexual activity, which they see the, the horrible results of in, 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 in their doctor's offices all the time in terms of diseases and destruction of bodily you know, whatever, you know, and he says, you can't say that. It's almost like there's a pressure in our society not to tell the truth that's staring us right, right in, 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 in our face of us. You know, it's like, it's like, whoa, I mean, don't you see the emperor doesn't have any clothes on, so to speak? No, we can't, we can't say that. We can't say that. Right. Can't put a cigarette in my mouth. I mean, that'll kill my lungs, but uh, somehow on anything sexual, we're just uh, unable to talk about it. And, and here's the key, right? So the, the Lord, forget the church for a moment, the Lord is rich in compassion. He knows how we're made. He knows what I need. So what I need, what you need, what everybody needs huh, is remarkable intimacy. I get that. That's what you want. You know, I mean, I'm made for profound friendship with, with God, but not just with God, with others. Mm -hmm. And so everybody's looking for that. I totally get that. I mean, that's why we end up making so many of the decisions that we make. Sexual sin, though always grave, um, is very understandable. Yeah. We're not talking about abuse here. We're talking about people well-intentioned. They're looking for affection. I'm looking for intimacy. I'm looking for somebody who honors me. What we're trying to just simply say is, though I understand that, I don't think this was actually honoring. I think this was harmful. Um, we, can, we can go much more yeah. into that, I know. Uh, well, how about, how about the whole vision of the beauty of a man and a woman committing themselves together for life and a willingness to open themselves up to having children. I mean, that, that seems like such a beautiful vision, you know? I mean, that, that you know, to, to hold up to people, you know? Well, you see all through scripture, starting from the very beginning, God's plan for marriage and the family is very simple. Um, it's to, uh, first of all, call the man and the woman to be an image of himself to one another, right? So the, before the woman even says a word, the man speaks for the very first time in scripture, you know, like this one at last is bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. Um, she shall be called woman for out of her man has she been taken. So the man recognizing just in seeing her, this is somebody who's like me, but she ain't like me. <laughs> and he understands I am made for you. I'm made to be a gift to you and you're made to be a gift to me. And this gift of each other brings forth new life. And, and God is, asking a man and a woman in the great gift that is the sacrament of marriage to cooperate in his plan of passing on the covenant. No children, no history. No history, no handing on of the covenant. I mean, so the world exists so that people can be brought into this extraordinary encounter with God who is the happiest of all beings who made me to share in his own happiness. And, and wants us after the short time on earth to raise us to something so mysterious and so unbelievable, like a partaker of the divine nature, like, whoa. You know, or like scripture says, right now we know we're the sons and daughters of God, but when, when Christ is revealed, it's gonna, it's gonna come to a whole different level. So like, we're being promised something, an amazing opportunity to participate in something and to live an existence that, literally is beyond what we could ask or imagine, as, right. as the scripture says, which is pretty amazing. And it's really worth enduring whatever suffering we have to endure in order to uh, turn away from our disordered desires and to say yes to life rather than saying yes to dark. And, and, and I wanna say also that, you know, every, you know we, we don't wanna single out homosexuality particularly. I mean, it, the, the culture is making us address that. this issue. Yeah, That's it's right. making us, I, I don't wanna talk about it, but we have to, so we, we did. But you know, there's a long list of things that make us unhappy and 
have the potential for excluding us from the kingdom of God. You know, fornication, adultery, uh, greed, robbery, theft, you know, even the misers are in there. You know, like, That's right. you know, like there's a, there's a whole list of, of disordered passions and desires that all of us have to kind of turn over to the Lord and, and undergo the healing process, you know, that, that the Holy Spirit wants to do in our soul so that we can more and more consistently choose life. Yeah, I think the challenge is, do we really believe that the gospel is more or do we think it's less? Do we think it's a better way of life or do we think it's a worse way of life? Um, Jesus says, I have come that you may have abundant life. I don't know what that is. I just know that I want it. Yeah. <laughs> I think yeah. it's more than whatever it is I got. Yeah. Like, I want more. Huh? And so, well, I, and where, I... And where that life is, is in the person of Jesus. That's it, right. It's it, in really, that's where it is. That's where heaven is. That, that's where... That's where love is. That's where truth is. That, that's where everything that our heart desires is. It, it, it's in relationship with him and what he does with our relationships with each other. And he's hanging on a cross with literally not a single drop of fluid in his body left to pour out. And he's saying to me, why won't you trust me? Yeah, look Who at, look has at, loved you yeah. like I have loved you? Yeah, and, you're, and you listen to all these other voices and you won't listen to mine, I have literally nothing left to give. I am nailed to a tree. I'm stripped naked. This is the creator of the world. This is the one who made you for friendship. I have poured out my life for you. This is the only truly innocent man that ever lived. And he's being crucified willingly so that we can be delivered from the darkness that, that's besieging us. And it reminds me of the words that Jesus spoke to St. Margaret Mary in the revelations of the Sacred Heart. He says, behold this heart that has so loved men, but has been so little loved in return. I mean, it's love. Love is reaching out to us. Love is kneeling at our feet. Love is washing our feet. And you say, right. how can you not have your heart touched by the humility of God? How can you have your heart not touched by the sacrifice of Jesus? How can you have your heart not touched by his total identification with humanity? That's right. You know, it's wow. And, and I think for me, that what, what comes to mind in, in, in these issues, the issues of repentance in general is, it's not an intellect problem. It's a will problem. You know, it's, it's not as though I don't understand the reasons why certain behaviors, whatever they might be, are harmful to me or harmful to others. Um, I know before I really kind of gave my life over to the Lord, and I know still even now wrestling with the Lord, um, I know good and evil. It was never, oh, that was wrong. I didn't know that. Um, it was always, I know this is evil and I want it anyway. And what has to happen- Sometimes then you cover over your conscience pretending that you don't know what's wrong. Right, and so what has to happen is, it's not two things. The, the, the mind has to get enlightened. That's the first conversion. But the deeper conversion is my will has to get one. And the only way my will can get one, I think, is I have to really understand who Jesus is yeah. and what he's done. Yeah. I, I have to come into this encounter that Pope Francis keeps talking about all the time and that you know Benedict talked about all the time and John Paul talked about all the time. I have to come to know Jesus, not to know about him, to know him, to experience his love, to understand, first of all, that he's not sitting there pointing a finger at me. He's sitting yeah. there going like this, come to me yeah. that you may have life, come yeah. to me that you may live. I yeah. know what you're carrying, come to me. I know what you want, I made you. Yeah, yeah, and so sometimes it's, it's really struck me that it's really important for us to be clear what the church teaches, but people aren't very motivated to pay attention to what the church teaches until they meet Jesus and discover that what the church teaches is passing on what Jesus has revealed to us about the path to happiness. And so otherwise it's so easy to say, well, these you know, old celibate men in Rome are making laws for my body. Right. When if all you can see is that, you're not seeing what's really going on because it's coming from Jesus. If you don't know who Jesus is, if you don't know he's Lord, if you don't know he's Savior, if you don't know his love, there's no, there's no interest or motivation in paying attention to his teaching. But once you know that he's Lord, once you know that he's love, then you say, gee, I, I think I'd better listen to what he's saying because I think he really knows what he's talking about because everything's been created through him and for him. So, hey, if I'm ever gonna be who I was created to be, I gotta I got do that in relationship to Jesus. I gotta do that hmm. because 
I was created through him and for him. So he's the, he's the key. He's the secret. He's, he's the way. He's the truth. He's That's the right. truth. Yeah. I mean, it goes back to what we've talked about before on other occasions. You know that for so many Catholics, I mean, I've been catechized, but I've never been evangelized. I was sacramentalized. You know, so I was baptized as a child. I grew up in a family. You know, I made my first communion. I kind of more or less checked out of church, uh, got got confirmed, went to high school, totally checked out of church, went to college, was long gone, got married, you know, after college to a young woman, where? In, in the Catholic church. Well, I'm, I'm Catholic, of course, you know, that's what I'm going to do. Then I have a child and repeat. And along the way, all these things happened and no one ever met him. Yeah. And so to be a Christian, as Pope Benedict would say over and over again, to be a Christian is not the result of an ethical choice. It's not a lifestyle. It's not a way of life. It's the result of an encounter with an event, with a person who's given an entirely new trajectory to all of my life. I've met somebody now who's changed everything. And until we meet him, well, then it's, of course, it's just laws and rules and, and a bunch of celibate men saying whatever. But once I've met him, once I've recognized he's poured out his life for me, once I've recognized that God is inviting me into friendship, yeah. well, how do, I, how do I fight back? Yeah, and, and he, has, he has my happiness at heart. I mean, he's not telling us these things because he wants to make us unhappy. He wants to place a burden on us. He wants, us lead, he wants to lead us out of a burden that we in the world are putting on ourselves right. in order to a freedom. That he, he would have put me on the cross if he wanted to do that and said he went to the cross. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, it, it's really important here, too, just, just to say something, because I know this doesn't often, people take things out of context, whatever, um, with whatever the issue might be, but especially with issues of sexuality. God hates nobody. Right. Nobody. Everybody, everybody's a precious person that he's created for only one purpose, for right. eternal happiness. There, there, there's no question that there are people out there speaking in the name of God who give the impression that God hates. God hates nobody. His desire is that all would be saved. Yep. He became flesh for each and every one of yep. us. He made each and every one of us to be divinized, as you said earlier. Yeah, and, and what he hates is the thing that will block us from, from fulfilling the purpose which we created. He, he, he hates the things which will keep us from the happiness right. that he created us for. You know, Jesus said, if you know my teaching, if you act on my teaching, you'll know the truth and the truth will set you free. He wants to bring us to a freedom right. from disordered desires. He wants to, as St. Bernard of Clairvaux says, the Lord has come to set our loves in order. You know, every, everything that we love has a proper place. You know, right. Jesus says, seek first the kingdom of God and his holiness. And these other things that you need and that you love will be added as well. But if you put the second place things in the first place, you're going to mess up the second per second place right. things and not find the satisfaction you were looking for. But if Jesus is at the center of your life, all these other things, our relationships, our money, sex, food, uh, recreation, can work. Take, work can all take their rightful place and, and work in the harmony that God created them to work in. So the key, Father John, is Jesus, isn't it? Yeah, it really is. The, ch the choices we face, now what's the choice? Yeah. Will I follow him? And who do you say he is? Right. Who do you say he is? Well, we're going to tell people about his Mercy. The booklet I've written is called Forever Grateful for Mercy. We'd like to make it available to you at no cost just for the asking. We've got a little video we're going to show you about how you can get it and more about what's in it. And when we come back, I'm going to ask Father John to preach and to pray about what we've been talking about. There's a lot of talk about mercy these days, but not a lot of understanding about what it actually is. And besides, there's a huge deception which presumes that God is so merciful that hardly anyone will be lost. In this booklet, I explain what scripture and the church actually teach about mercy and what kind of response is necessary for it to be effective in our lives. I also explain what Jesus told St. Faustina about divine mercy and the tragic consequences of not responding to it wholeheartedly. This booklet will greatly help you live with confidence in turbulent times and will help anyone you share it with to open their hearts to receive mercy while there is still time. Order your free copy today by going to RenewalMinistries.net or by calling 1-800-282-4789. Well, Father John, we talked about a really important topic and we communicated some really important truths. 
I, I just know that, that people need some kind of help now in kind of receiving or processing what they just heard. And yeah, maybe real quickly before we do that, just an encouragement to people um, because the lay faithful have such a responsibility to, to be able to evangelize on all areas. Huh? So to find out not only what the church teaches, it's all three paragraphs on this issue with, with regards to homosexuality in the catechism, but to try to find out why. Why would the church teach that? Why would God say that? That might be a good uh, thing just to mention. One of the things that comes to me, uh, comes to mind as we're talking is just how many people could be hearing all that we're talking about and just feeling crushed. Mm -hmm. um, my past is not a great past uh, before the Lord called me to priesthood. Um, but no one's, no one's past is a great past, right? I mean, there's, there's no saint without a past except for Mary. And so, you know, two people come to mind real quick for me. One is the woman caught in the act of adultery in John 8, and the other is uh, the Samaritan woman who's had five husbands, and she's with another guy right now who's not her husband. And so it's very easy for us to hear. This is what the evil one wants to do. The evil one wants to condemn. The evil one wants to accuse. The evil one wants to say, that's you. Um, you're disqualified from There's the love no of God. There's no hope for you. That's right. Yeah. You're stuck. You're useless. You're discarded. Um, you're defined by your sin. That's a lie. It's from hell. There's something fatally defective with you. Right. Yeah. Everybody has a past, and there's and there isn't anybody for whom God isn't calling right now into a into a brand new friendship with Him, and I mean that's the whole point of the. Have mercy. you seen that billboard on, on the highway? That says every saint has a past and every sinner has a future. Yeah. I love that line. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I love that line. It's so true, right? I mean, there's there is no sinner right now. There's nobody listening to this show for whom like, God can't bust in right now and just say, hey, I can take your sin, I can make it white as snow. Yeah. I see it over and over again in confession. I see people walk in, they're slumped over, they're filled with shame, they feel like I'm defined by my sin, I can never get out of the life I'm in, and then all of a sudden they encounter Jesus, they experience His mercy, and they walk out, they sit up, their heads are back, yeah. they're smiling, they can look at themselves in the mirror, because they've encountered love. And isn't there a particular grace and power in the sacrament of confession and reconciliation? I mean, if you're weighed down with, mm -hmm. with, with sin, with discouragement, just, just go to the sacrament of reconciliation and lay it all out, you know, lay it all out and experience the actual mercy of God being applied to you personally through the... Through the I didn't go to confession for 10 years. For 10 years, I didn't go to confession. The, the, the confessor that somebody might go to who's feeling like, oh, no, I think God's tapping me on the shoulder saying, hey, it's time to come to confession. Come to confession. You're yeah. not going to get yelled at. You're not going to get you know, yeah. reprimanded. Yeah. You're going to get a welcome home. This would be a very practical step to take in response to the program. Any, any burden you're carrying, any sin you're, you're, you're enslaved to, bring it to the sacrament of reconciliation, begin the process of healing, receive the forgiveness and mercy of God. Until next week, this is Father John Ricardo and Ralph Martin wishing you the very best, a life at which Jesus Christ is the center in which all the other loves can take their rightful place. I'm all